Welcome to another Mythology video. Today's video is one I've been dreaming about making for a long long time. <laughs> Today I'd like to dazzle you with the solutions of some of the most famous problems in the history of mathematics. These problems had remained unsolved for more than 2000 years after they were first puzzled over in ancient Greece. The problems arose very naturally as part of the Greek mathematicians quest to determine the possible geometric constructions when all were permitted is to draw lines and circles. That is, what is possible using just the most basic mathematical tools, the ruler and the compass. For example, given a square, we could construct a new square of twice the area just using our basic tools. However, unlike doubling a square like this, doubling a cube turned out to be anything but easy. Nobody was able to figure out whether, given a cube, we could construct a cube of double the volume by just using ruler and compass. This is the first of those ancient problems I'll be tackling today. Similarly, if you are given two lines making some angle, then halving that angle with ruler and compass is easy. Let us draw a couple of circles, there and there is the bisector. But nobody could come up with a ruler and compass construction that would trisect an arbitrary angle. That's problem number two. Next, using ruler and compass to construct equilateral triangles, squares, regular pentagons and regular hexagons is not a problem at all. But what about regular heptagons? Nobody had a clue for thousands of years. That's problem number three. Finally, most famously, and what turned out to be by far the hardest, is it possible to square a circle? That is, given a circle, is it possible to use ruler and compass to construct a square of exactly the same area? Well, as I said, it took over 2000 years to finally answer these questions. And what's the answer? The answer is, stop trying, you're wasting your time. In the 19th century it was proved that it's impossible to use ruler and compass to double a cube or to trisect an arbitrary angle or to construct a regular heptagon or to square a circle. But who gets to see these impossibility proofs? Not many people except a few pure maths majors who may encounter them immersed in a course on Galois theory. Really heavy duty stuff. However, on close inspection it turns out that those proofs only really require some of the semi-heavy duty parts of Galois theory. Then if you are incredibly stubborn and <laughs> you try really really hard, it's possibly possible to distill the essence of these proofs into one short and not too hard YouTube video. I don't know about you, but I find the idea of making a video like this super exciting. It's an opportunity to make a small but tangible contribution to something that people have been struggling with for thousands of years. And I hope that for you it's an opportunity to get to the core of some classic and beautiful and hard mathematics. To get some insight into a theory normally considered out of reach of mere mortals. Okay, here's the plan for today. I'll first tell you exactly what it means to construct things with ruler and compass, the precise rules of the game. Then I'll go very carefully through the proof that doubling the cube is impossible. Our argument that doubling the cube is impossible will be a proof by contradiction and will run like this. If doubling the cube was possible, then we can use that to show that the cube root of 2, a number closely related to our problem, could be written as an expression that only involves rational numbers and square roots. However, as we'll also show, this would imply that cube root of 2 is in fact equal to a rational number. Since this is definitely not the case, doubling the cube cannot be possible either. After the hard work of doubling the cube, I'll then tidy up by sketching how this wonderful proof by contradiction can be modified to also take care of trisecting angles and constructing regular heptagons. And finally, squaring the circle can also be ticked off easily because we already did most of the heavy lifting for the proof in a previous video on the transcendence of pi. As you may already have guessed, this video is a challenging one. So as for my previous masterclass videos, this one is broken into levels of enlightenment. Six in all and each with its own mathematical superhero guide. 
Of course, feel free to start skipping if it gets too tricky and let me know how far you make it in the comments. Okay, without further ado, mathematical seatbelts on and on to level one. This video is all about the things that a ruler and compass cannot do. But first, let's ask, what can they do? What can we construct with ruler and compass? To start, let me begin drawing to just give you a feel for what's going on, okay? Let's start with two points in the plane. Now draw the line through them, okay? Draw a circle with this red point as its center through the other point. So now we have a third point the other spot where the circle and line intersect. Draw a circle with this red point as center through this new green point. That gives us three new points of intersection and our construction is already getting pretty and also pretty interesting. Now draw a line connecting these two red points. Another intersection. Clearly this point is the midpoint between our two starting points. And our second line is clearly the perpendicular bisector of our starting points. Plus, these three red points there are the corners of an equilateral triangle. Pretty impressive. By just drawing a couple of lines and circles you get all this good stuff. What else is there? Let's draw another smaller circle like so. Okay, two more points of intersection, which together with the original two points form the corners of a square. Pretty easy, right? A regular hexagon is also hiding just around the corner. Let's go and find that one too. All child's play, but what about regular pentagons? That's not so obvious. Let me show you how you can do this, starting with this part of the picture. There, just that one. First we locate the point halfway between these two points. Now you all remember how to do that, right? So I'll skip the details. Hmm, nothing very five-ish yet, but just watch. Pretty cool, right? But maybe I cheated. Is that really a perfect regular pentagon? It definitely is not obvious, but yep it is. And your first real challenge today is to work through the details and nail down a proof. Okay, so having played with ruler and compass a bit, we're ready to declare the rules of our game. Here we go. At any stage of the game, we have before us a collection of points, lines and circles, right? Then there are two ways we can proceed. First way, Choose any two points and draw the line through them. As well as adding the new line to our collection, it also adds all the intersection points of this new line with the previous lines and circles. So there you go, all of those go in. And there's a second way. And that second way is to again start by picking any two points. And then you draw a circle centered at one of the points and passing through the second point. The new circle is then added to the collection, as are all the new intersection points. So, those are the rules of our game. Pretty easy, right? Now what about those special problems, doubling the cube and so forth? Okay, you have a cube and your aim is to double its volume using just ruler and compass. What this means in our game is that you start with two points, the side lengths of our cube apart, and your aim is to construct in a finite number of ruler and compass steps, two points that are the side lengths of the double cube apart. For the purposes of our game, we can assume that our original cube has side lengths one, and so also volume of one. And the volume of the double cube would have to be two, of course, right? And so its side lengths would have to be the cube root of 2. Got it? Starting with two points a distance one apart, our aim is to construct two points that are a distant cube root of 2 apart. Similarly, a circle of radius 1 has area pi. So constructing a square of the same area means 
the square should have a side length of root pi. As I already showed you, constructing squares is not a problem. So in our game, squaring the circle amounts to a beginning with two points a distance one apart and using them to construct two new points a distance root pi apart. In exactly the same way the other two problems I showed you at the beginning boil down to starting again with points a distance one apart and using these points to construct two specific new lengths. In fact, let's go all Cartesian and pin down things a little bit further. Let's make our two beginning points the origin and one zero, the point one unit to the right along the x-axis. Now there's a little ruler and compass magic that I won't go into but which helps simplify our problems. It turns out that if we can construct a segment of a certain length somewhere, then we can always translate and rotate using ruler and compass to obtain a segment of the same length starting at the origin and lying along the positive x-axis. That means our cube doubling problem boils down to using ruler and compass to locate the point a distant cube root of 2 along the x-axis. Similarly, squaring the circle boils down to locating root pi on the x-axis. And there are two more mysterious numbers which arise from our other two problems. Those two guys. Of course, faced with the task of constructing numbers such as the cube root of 2 and root pi, it's natural to just stare helplessly into space, <laughs> which is pretty much all that happened for 2000 years. So let's look at it another way. Let's ask, what numbers can we construct? Well, obviously all the integers can be constructed like this. Then as we've seen, we can construct midpoints. These are the integer multiples of one half. They are more midpoints here. This gives all the integer multiples of one fourth and so on. What else? Lots. <laughs> It turns out that once you've constructed two numbers a and b, you can also construct their sum, their difference, their product and their quotient by executing four easy constructions. For example, to construct a plus b, you just need to transfer a distance, which remember is no problem with ruler and compass. So there we go. Just push it over and that's a plus b. There. And b minus a is just as easy. Okay, let's have a look. Let's push this over, that's b minus a. Next, to construct a times b, we also need to be able to construct perpendiculars, which we've already seen, and to draw parallel lines, which is also straightforward with ruler and compass. Ignoring the fiddly details, here is the key idea of this product construction. Pretty nice, huh? and constructing a over b is similarly easy. Fantastic! Okay, so we can add, subtract, multiply and divide constructible numbers and with the integers already constructed, this means that all quotients of integers are constructible. In other words, we can construct all rational numbers with ruler and compass. Anything else? Well, yes, we can definitely construct some irrational numbers. For example, root 2 is the diagonal of a unit square, which is easy to construct. In fact, with a little Pythagorasing, it's easy to construct the square root of any positive integer. But there's more. I'll now show you how taking any positive number we've already constructed, we can always construct that number's square root. Suppose we've already constructed the number a down there. First add 1 to a to get the green number here, using rule and compass of course. Now half the green number, draw this circle, draw the perpendicular through the blue point, then the pink segment has length root a. A pretty easy recipe to follow. I'll leave it as homework for you and your friend Pythagoras to check out that this actually works. But just for fun, let's calculate root 2 this way. That should be root 2. But root 2 is also the length of the diagonal of a unit square. There's the square. Well, let's check. Yep, that looks about right, which means it must be true. Well, of course not. <laughs> but as you will show in your homework, it is right. 
right? Right? You will show this. So it turns out we can construct a lot of numbers. Starting with the numbers 0 and 1, we can add, subtract, multiply, divide and square root lengths any finite number of times. And here then are just a few examples of numbers we can construct. That's a ton of constructible numbers, but are there even more? What do you think? The answer to this question is no. <laughs> These nested square rooty creatures based upon the integers are the only kind of numbers we can construct with ruler and compass. And it's actually very easy to see that this is the case. Suppose you have two points with square rooty coordinates. Then the equation of the line through those points will have square rooty coefficients. They're pretty obvious. Those are square rooty, right? And a circle with square rooty center and passing through a square rooty point will have a square rooty radius and so will also have an equation with square rooty coefficients. There, that's the equation. And then how do we get new points? By intersecting lines with lines, lines with circles and circles with circles. That corresponds to solving pairs of linear and quadratic equations and the solutions of those systems of equations are of course all square rooty again. And so to summarize, start with our two numbers 0 and 1 on the x-axis. We can use rule and compass to produce any square rooty coordinates we want, but only square rooty coordinates, nothing else. So you're back for more. Very good. <laughs> so now we know exactly what type of numbers we can construct those square rooty monsters. But what about the cube root of 2? Can that number be written as a mess of square roots? It seems unlikely, but how do we go about proving it? Well, some of those square root monsters are more monstrous than others, right? So let's start easy, consider some of the less scary monsters first and work our way up. Hopefully, we'll detect a pattern which will suggest a plan of attack. So what are the very simplest square rooty numbers? Well, that would be the fractions with no roots at all. So let's first ask whether the cube root of 2 can be written as a fraction. That is, our base level question is, is cube root of 2 a rational number? And as all regular mythologists would know, the answer is a big no. The cube root of 2 is not a rational number. I recently did a whole video about how you can quickly prove the irrationality of this and a bunch of other rooty numbers using the amazing rational root theorem. So let's take the irrationality of the cube root of 2 as a given. We'll also take it as known that square root of 2, square root of 3, square root of 5 and so on are all irrational, okay? Not a big deal. Okay, now as a warm-up exercise, let's think about all square rooty numbers of this form there, where both a and b are rational numbers. There's absolutely nothing special about 7 here, just that it's a rational number whose square root is irrational. Could have used lots of other numbers there. Now, what we'd like to prove is that the cube root of 2 cannot be written as one of those root 70 numbers over there. That would be progress, right? Little tiny special progress, but progress. Now if you're worried that this tiny progress will be too tiny, don't. Later there will be a humongous plot revelation that will more than compensate for the incy vinciness here. Anyway, to prove our special case, we set up the usual proof by contradiction. So we start by assuming that cube root of 2 is equal to one of these special numbers. In other words, we are assuming that our number is the solution of this equation here. Cubing the cube root of 2 gives 2, right? In a moment we'll show that the assumption that a plus b root 7 solves the equation implies that the conjugate of this number a minus b root 7 does so as well. However, ignoring complex number possibilities, this equation has one and just one solution, the cube root of 2. Which means that, well what, our plus solution and our minus solution must be the same. And b must therefore be 0. But that would mean that the root 7 stuff is irrelevant and that the rational number a itself 
would solve our equation. In other words, the conclusion at the end of this chain of consequences is that cube root of 2 would have to be rational. Which as you agreed, you agreed, <laughs> is nonsense. And therefore we've arrived at the contradiction we are chasing. So again, the assumption that cube root of 2 is of the form a plus b root 7 implies a contradiction which proves that the cube root of 2 is not of this form. But of course to make the proof complete I still have to fill in that crucial step of the argument. I have to show that if a plus b root 7 solves this equation then a minus b root 7 does so too. Okay, you ready? <laughs> then here we go. So when in doubt calculate, right? So moving the 2 to the left, plugging our root 70 thing in and carefully expanding we get, let's see, all of this mess, okay? <laughs> but since we assumed a and b are rational numbers, the blue and the yellow numbers must be rational too, right? But then much more than being rational, the yellow number must be exactly 0. Why? Because if it weren't, we could solve for root 7 like this. And that would mean root 7 is a quotient of rational numbers and so would also be rational. We already know that this is not the case. So the yellow number is definitely equal to 0. But with the whole left side being equal to 0, that means that the blue number has to be equal to 0 too. And now everything's clear, right? Well, maybe not. <laughs> but we're basically done. The key observation is that the blue expression only contains an even power of the number b. And both terms in the yellow part have b to an odd power. So what? Here's the trick. Let's replace b with minus b. What changes? Well the blue number is left unchanged since the 1 minus sign gets squared away. And because of the odd powers the yellow becomes negative like this. So there the minus just goes out, that's it. So the overall effect of replacing b by minus b in this left side of our equation was simply to turn the plus sign in the middle into a minus. Overall that's the only change, right? But since both blue and yellow are zero, the overall expression with the minus is still equal to zero. How does that help? Well remember the original blue and yellow expression was obtained by plugging our original root 70 number into x cubed minus 2. But that means we get the new blue and yellow expression by replacing b in our number by minus b. And then again plugging this new number into x cubed minus 2. But since the new blue and yellow expression is also equal to 0, this means that our new number is also a solution of our cubic equation. Ta-da! <laughs> well maybe, maybe you have to go through this stuff again, but that's basically it. Right? Once again, the assumption that our original number a plus b root 7 solves x cubed minus 2 is equal to 0 implies that its conjugate a minus b root 7 solves this equation as well. And this then implies the contradiction and we conclude that cube root of 2 cannot possibly be of the form a plus b root 7. Great! So you're still here. Fantastic! <laughs> now I promised you a big plot revelation. We're getting there. It turns out that we can iterate our a plus b root 7 proof by contradiction to conclude that the cube root of 2 is not equal to any square root number. To make the iteration work we need to isolate the essential ingredients of our proof. Turns out that these ingredients all have to do with the rational numbers which served as a foundation for what we're doing. There are four ingredients. First, we note that cube root of 2 is an irrational number. Second, we needed the property that adding, subtracting, multiplying and dividing of rational numbers always gives rational numbers. Right? We needed this to be able to conclude that the blue and yellow numbers being made up of rational numbers are rational themselves. 
We also needed this ingredient when we argued that the ratio of two rational numbers is rational. The second ingredient, the property of being closed under the four arithmetic operations, is described by saying that the set of rational numbers is a subfield of the field of all real numbers. It tells us that the rationals form a self-contained universe of numbers. Okay, the third important ingredient was the fact that 7 inside the square root is a rational number, right? We needed 7 to be rational because at various spots we used that squaring the square root brought us back to a rational number. For example, when we expand it right at the beginning, let's do it again, so there, expand, 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 that 7 there is the result of squaring the square root and we need that to be rational. The last ingredient of our proof was the fact that although 7 is a rational number, its square root is not. We use this in two spots. Okay, to summarize, our magic ingredients are the cube root of 2 is not a rational number. Rational numbers form a subfield. 7 is rational, square root of 7 is not. And from all that follows that cube root of 2 is not one of the red numbers. Okay, now it turns out that the red numbers themselves are also a subfield. That is, if you add, subtract, multiply or divide two root 70 numbers, then you again get a root 70 number. They're like this. All straightforward except for the division which involves a conjugate trick that some of you may remember from school. And you can worry about division by zero if you're the worrying type. Challenge for you is to fill in the details in the comments. Okay, ingredients again. Cube root of two is not a rational number. Rational numbers are a subfield. 7 is rational. Square root of 7 is not. From this it follows that cube root of 2 is not one of the red numbers. Now the red numbers themselves are a subfield and now things are supposed to repeat. So what comes next? Well, something like this. So what we need is a number that is red <laughs> but whose square root is not. Okay, and I'll just give you one, okay? So 1 plus root 7 is such a number and root 1 plus root 7 is not a red number. And now with exactly the same arguments as before we can conclude that all these blue numbers are not candidates for anything that can be equal to cube root 2. And now things repeat again because the blue numbers can also be seen to be a subfield with exactly the same arguments as before. And now, well, repeat. So we need a line here. So we need a number that is blue, but whose square root is not. And there's lots and lots of possibilities. So I'll just give you one again. 86 divided by five is such a number. And now with exactly the same arguments as before, it follows that cube root of two is not one of the pink numbers. <laughs> and we can go on like this. At this stage, perhaps you're feeling a little rooted, as we say in Australia. Time to catch our breath and take stock. The field property of the subworlds of numbers that we've been looking at shows that the final pink numbers are exactly the numbers that can be constructed by combining the rational numbers and these three rooty expressions with the usual arithmetic, adding, subtracting, multiplying and dividing. For example, this complicated rooty number is one of the pink numbers. Same for this one and this one. And because they are all pink numbers, none of them can equal cube root of 2. Of course, any individual pink number can be ruled out using a calculator. But the point is that we've ruled out all the pink numbers of that subfield and we can go to bigger and bigger subfields. Given any square rooty number, we can start from the rational numbers and by iterating the extension process we can construct in a finite number of steps a subfield that contains that particular square root number. And so that square root number, any square root number, cannot be cube root of 2. And that's it. That completes the proof that cube root of 2 is not a square root number and therefore that the cube cannot be doubled with rule and compass. Very hard work but also very, very nice, don't you think? 
Now before going to the next level there's just a little tidying up to do. Remember that we knew or we assumed or you simply trusted me that root 1 plus root 7 is not part of the a plus b root 7 subfield and that root 86 divided by 5 is not part of the last subfield and so on. But even if root 1 plus root 7 was part of the a plus b root 7 subfield that would have been a problem. Why? Because that supposedly new subfield would be just the same as the previous subfield. So there would just be no new numbers to worry about. That would just mean that to get to this point we would need one less step of the extension process. It's the same for all the square roots that go into building our subfield extensions. If the subfield is enlarged we know how to handle it and if not then nothing has changed. All that matters is that whenever our subfield is enlarged we are guaranteed that the new subfield still cannot contain cube root of 2. And this really finishes the proof that no square root in number is equal to cube root of 2. In turn this shows that it is impossible to double a cube just using ruler and compass. What an ingenious argument, don't you think? But there were four problems that I promised to solve in this video. One down after quite a fight and still three to go. How long a video is this going to be? <laughs> well, not that much longer. It turns out that proving the impossibility of trisecting angles and constructing a regular heptagon with ruler and compass can be taken care of in a very similar fashion. Just like doubling the cube boiled down to showing that the solution of the cubic equation x cubed minus 2 is equal to 0 cannot be a square root expression. Showing the impossibility of trisecting and heptagoning reduces to showing that the roots of two other cubic equations cannot be square root expressions. First, trisecting an angle. Of course some angles can be trisected. The angle 90 degrees for example is easy to trisect. But the point is that not all angles can be trisected. And to show this we just have to prove that one particular angle cannot be trisected and we've chosen 60 degrees as our victim. Here's a quick run through of how you show that ruler and compass cannot be used for constructing 20 degree angles. That then proves the impossibility of trisecting a constructible angle 60 degrees. And you guessed it, it will be a proof by contradiction. So let's assume that starting with our two points it was possible to construct a 20 degree angle. Then we can transfer the angle to the origin like this. And then constructing this perpendicular also gives us the cosine of 20 degrees. Time to dust off your high school trick. Remember your double angle formulas? Well there are also triple angle formulas and the formula for the cosine is this. Substituting 20 degrees for theta we get this. The cosine of 60 degrees is 1 half and this means that the cosine of 20 degrees is a solution of this cubic equation here. Now we can use the rational root theorem from two videos ago to prove in the blink of an eye that this equation has no rational roots. And because we are again dealing with a cubic equation things proceed very much along the lines of the cube root of 2 proof. In particular assuming that a solution of this equation is contained in a square root extension field forces the conclusion that there is also a solution in the smaller subfield and this then gives the usual contradiction. Challenge for you, fill in the details. One slight difference you'll have to deal with, the cubic for the trisection has three real solutions rather than just one. For those who get lost or just plain exhausted, <laughs> I can understand, I'll also provide some links to the write-up. And on to heptagons. If it was possible to construct a regular heptagon with ruler and compass then starting with the usual two points it'd be possible to transfer the heptagon here. This would mean that it was possible to construct the number cosine of 360 divided by 7 degrees. There, that creature. And then it's fiddly but it can be shown 
that this cosine is a solution to this cubic equation there. And it's straight sailing from there. Again, I'd say first try to fill in the details yourself in the comments and if you get desperate, follow the links in the description. Finally, finally, finally. <laughs> what about squaring the circle? And what about using ruler and compass to construct the number root pi? Well, if root pi was constructible, then its square, the number pi, would also be constructible. However, it turns out that all square rooting numbers are algebraic. That is, all square rooting numbers, and in fact all rooting numbers, are solutions of polynomial equations with integer coefficients. But pi is not. As we showed you in a previous masterclass methodology video, pi is a transcendental number. It is not the solution of such a polynomial equation. This proves that pi cannot be constructed and that's all there is to it. But to nail down the last little bit of the proof, how does one prove that all square rooting numbers are algebraic? It turns out to be pretty easy. The idea is to start with a square root expression set it equal to x and then unravel the resulting equation successively isolating and squaring away the square roots. Eventually all that is left are integers and powers of x. To give you some intuition I'll finish this video with an animation of constructing such an equation for one of our previous scary square root expressions. But before the pretty ending, first let me finish with a few thoughts on impossibilities. Today's video was a tricky tour through some difficult mathematics. It easily took me 200 hours to put it together. And still, even after me and Marty there behind the camera <laughs> have agonized and re-agonized over every detail of the video, it's tough going. I don't expect that everybody who watches this will get everything in a first viewing. Don't feel bad if you don't. Just give it another go and remember it took mathematicians a couple thousand years to sort out these ideas. And it took that long for a reason. And so if it takes you a few viewings and maybe a question or two in the comments, that's perfectly fine. But there's one more thing. Every year I get at least a few people writing to me with the news that after devoting anything from a few seconds to half a lifetime of study, they have managed to square a circle or have achieved some other impossibility. Of course, they're all wrong. It's important to realize that if you change the rules of our game just a tiny, tiny little bit, it's then no problem at all to square the circle and so on. And this has been known since the days of Euclid. The plan is actually to make another video about this fascinating topic of rule changing in the near future. Let's see. Anyway, it's very easy to misinterpret the rules of the Greek game and end up with false solutions of those ancient problems, especially if you base your understanding on a bare bones exposition of the rules such as the ones I have given in this video. Just like those people who write to me, there have been many thousands of people who've made this mistake over the years and whole books have been written about their pointless endeavors. To make absolutely sure that you really truly understand the rules and most definitely before you embark on the pointless quest of squaring the circle, I recommend you very carefully study those rules and the common mistakes people make interpreting them. The wiki page on ruler and compass constructions is a great starting point. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> to finish off in a much prettier style, here's the construction of a polynomial equation with integer coefficients that has this square root expression as a solution. Okay, let's call this guy, oh I don't know, how about x? Now you can watch the polynomial materialize and that's all for today. <laughs>